Founded by legendary producer Mickey Most, Rack Studios has been the home of many incredible records since 1976. We visit it to see equipment old and new, hear some stories about Mickey, visit the in-house tech department and take a look at the brand new Atmos Capable Studio 4. So we've got four commercial studios at Rack Studios. Studio One is our sort of larger, largest recording studio and we have lots of um, orchestral ensembles in there. Sometimes bigger bands will take it for a chunk of time and we'll set it up and camp out in there for a month um, and do a load of recording and it's, it's a fantastic sounding live room and you can basically put anything anywhere and it sounds really good, which is really nice. Studio two is our sort of smaller recording room. Uh, it's great for four piece bands. It's very favored by more independent bands, like smaller indie bands tend to love that room. We are sat right now in studio three, um, which is probably much closer to a classic studio that you would find elsewhere. We've got a new VR console here, whereas the other two have APIs. And it's, it's sort of a good size. We can do maybe up to 16 strings in here, but it's a good size for band recording. And we've got lots of keys in here. And then Studio 4 is our newly renovated writing and mixing and Atmos room. Mickey was a producer and a publisher and um, he was always booking other studios to do his recordings in and so he decided to bring it all in-house and start his own facility. So that is when he founded Rack Studios. So they found the building, this building here on Charlbert Street in 1975 and Studios 1 and 2 opened their doors in 1976. I came to Rack actually to make a Pretenders record and I remember, I quite remember it really clearly because I drove down from Sheffield, which is where I was based before, um, still living in Sheffield, and drove past, uh, drove into St John's Wood and actually drove past Kate Moss coming out of her four-storey terrace house just around the corner here. And the sun was shining and the, it was actually a really beautiful day and I, and I kind of pulled up outside rack with the columns and everything. And I just felt really fucking smug. I was like... This, I, you know, I'm coming here, I'm doing a Pretenders record with Chrissy Hind. I've just seen Kate Moss around the corner. I'm outside this amazing studio. I walked in, I was like, wow, okay, this is pretty good, because it's a bit more rock and roll than Abbey Road. Then we didn't work here for a, maybe a year or so. And in, the, in that year, Mickey actually, Mickey actually died, which was incredibly sad. And we went to the funeral and everything. And, and actually, this, it left this place slightly rudderless, because it had sort of been like the Mickey Moe show. Although it had been a commercial studio, it was really built around his endeavours. Then the drive from his wonderful daughter, a really good friend of mine, Natalie, um, was to try and make the studio, bring it up to date. I mean, obviously not lose the character, but to sort of make it very much more high functioning. Um, and it took a little while, but you know, the, this studio's won Studios of the Year countless times. I, I can't, I've, I've lost track. Rack have definitely sort of made more of an effort to keep a low profile. We kind of, we want to be a safe haven for artists to work in. We tend to sort of grow our engineers from junior positions up to senior positions. So we've got some people who've been here for pushing, who've been with us for pushing 20 years, who started as runners and assistants and are now quite senior engineers and, you know, do a lot, like do an amount of work here and amount of work elsewhere, um, like in their own studios and stuff. But they're very much part of the Rack family. I'm Gilly Portal uh, and I've been working at Rack for a year. I'm a runner and assistant engineer here. And I've been, I did my training at Abbey Road Institute for a year. And then I got a job here in this amazing place. So basically I'm taking care of setting up the sessions, putting the mics up on stands, placing them, taking care of the artists and everything around it, patching and making sure everything's connected where it should be. I think the longer that someone is, assist is working as, 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 as an assistant engineer to other engineers, the more techniques you learn and the more sort of well-rounded engineer you come out to be. So I think probably people do end up assisting here for longer than they do in other studios, perhaps, but I think they do become 
very well-rounded engineers at the end of the day. I feel like rock has that unique vibe of, you know, experimenting a lot and doing things, trying different things, recording in the hallway or doing those type of um, miking. But also on the other hand, you know, there's there's the request orchestral and film scoring sessions that they're much more by the book kind of a thing. So I think there's a lot of space to think outside of the box and experiment, which, which is really incredible to witness and to be part of. Some things that Rack are quite well known for are our biscuit cupboard. There's a biscuit cupboard, which is legendary, the Rack biscuit cupboard, and all the string players and all the choirs from all over London know about the Rack biscuit cupboard. Mickey was, he used to arrive in his Rolls Royce, and he'd come in and he'd go, uh, are you winning? And he'd sit around a bit and have a chat and he'd do stuff, you know, whatever. And then rather than, rather than like going to Tesco's, he'd get in his Rolls Royce, he'd drive to Costco, and he'd fill the boot of the Rolls Royce with bargain biscuits and bargain toilet rolls. And it probably cost him more to drive his like 12 miles to the gallon Bentley thingy up to Costco and back again. And we'd look at him like coming out with his bags, his Costco bags. Yeah, there's that man worth hundreds of millions of pounds driving, you know, a 200,000 pound car carrying Costco bags because he'd saved like 14 pence. It's really hard to put your finger on. It's just nice <laughs> it really is it's, it's everyone just seems to really enjoy being here you know people work here you know people that work here stay for years and years decades clients come back time and again and it is a very highly functioning studio it's got it's got full you know five days a week maintenance kevin upstairs if things go wrong, they get fixed straight away. You know, it's nothing worse than walking in, especially doing like a string session or something which is where you've got a bit of time pressure. You know, you put the desk up and then and you get a crackle and you're like, oh, what's the, what's the, you know, what is it? What, and, you know, sessions can be ruined by bad maintenance. And, you know, you, you, I'm not, I'm not going to point any fingers, but not all the studios in London are maintained to a level which is really professional. Um, and it's and it's and what 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 suffers unfortunately is often the producer who's under a lot of pressure and a vibe, you know. So if you go sit around for two hours waiting for something to get fixed, everybody's like, you know. So it's so great. My name's Kevin. Um, I've been here for seventeen years. Um, I first started um, well way back in the distant past. I started in a electronics manufacturing, making diodes and um, thyristors and things. Ended up moving to, from there in Kent to Maidstone and getting a job at Shaw Electronics, the microphone cartridge people. There for a good number of years, about 14 years um, there. And then a job came up at CBS Studios, which I heard about. Went for an interview there and got the job there. Was there for about 15 years until about 80, um, was it no 2004 2005 when unfortunately Whitfield Street finally closed or Sony Munich finally closed and I managed to get a job here and I've been here 17 years <laughs> most of the electronics is electronics it's either transistors it used to be valves which are um, still a fair amount of valve equipment around in studios now it's gone more digital in the desks it's more, a lot more complicated and a lot less easy to actually try and repair it or fault find it. But it's still very similar to any digital electronics that's out in the um, consumer world. Originally, a challenging job was actually understanding all of the modifications that have been done to the API, especially in Studio One, which just weren't annotated anywhere in any of the diagrams and a lot of the diagrams I've got stored under there don't necessarily tie up exactly with what we've got uh, whether they've been lost or what over the time and so trying to find I think it was the, the they've complained the talkback wasn't working anymore and it just trying to find where it went from the microphone through the myriad of wires under the desk and inside and to the patch bay and it seemed to go to the patch and back again and then to something, then back to the patch bay. And it's just, it's been, 
you know, a few hours laying under the desk, head inside the desk <laughs> to try and find where it came from, only to find that the reason it didn't work was because it went through another um, control, volume control, which wasn't labelled as anything to do with talkback, and that had been turned down. So it's a vintage console. Um, it's incredible, the sound of it. It's, it has like this specific color that um, I love. I just really love. We use it as a, normally as a split console. So mics are going there and we're monitoring from that side. It has the, the magnificent EQs on each channel. I think normally in most of the sessions we, we do EQ or compression on the way in. We use all, all the outboard. There are some engineers that would rather, you know, have it like the, it's clean as you can to be able to do it after in the box. But I think in, like our engineers normally do that and try to get as much like to, to shape the sound as much as they can on the way in and commit to that. Most of the stuff is very reliable. Uh, there's very little blows up from day to day in the, in the desks. Fortunately, the API desks are so simple that there's very little in them to actually go electronically wrong. Uh, a lot of the things is just as the same as, unfortunately, as the Neve, is switches. Switches become noisy over a quarter period of time of switching and or not being switched and um, tarnishing contacts. And so there seems to be, it's more mechanical most of the time than it is actually electronic. I go through them every now and again. Uh, like I said, we've got a session, big session starting next week in, um, in the building. And I went through Studio One's desk where they'll be doing most of their recording, such like, and check every single channel is receiving a mic input sending a mic into out, line input, everything's going to Pro Tools and back again without being low level somewhere. It's that sort of thing. As If the studio's empty, I would go in and check it through and just have a look, see if it's doing what it should do. Yeah, the knees are, get so hot, they, as I think a lot of people know, they, they need, um, they dry, the capacitors dry out and it needs redoing. We had before that in Studio uh, 3 a Neve 51 series, but after about three or four years of being here, we noticed it started to see certain things not doing right. You notice that the bass response starts tailing off on a few channels here and there, at which point in time I went through um, and recapped every single channel over the course of about a uh, year and a half, two years or so. It's a laborious job soldering and I eventually ended up buying a desolder station, which I should have got in the first place because it made life so much easier. <laughs> you know, just being able to suck the stuff out electronically you know, with a handheld thing while you're actually melting it is so much easier. I've also, over the since I've been here, recapped all the APIs. And when we had the SSL, I recapped that as well. So. I've changed a lot of capacitors in, in 17 years. <laughs> most big records, and there are exceptions, obviously, but most big records are still made in a very traditional way. And, and I think often, you know, you go, oh, well, you know, people can make records in the bedrooms. And of course they can. And often people make completely brilliant records on incredibly limited budgets and incredibly limited equipment. But you will generally find that I'd say 90% of records are are big records as in not just single hits but actually have albums attached to them and, and artists who are proper brands attached to them are made in ways which aren't actually that different to what the way they made records 20 or 30 years ago you know you listen to an Adele record or you listen to a Sam Smith record or you listen to I don't know whoever and they generally have real drummers on them and real guitarists and real pianos and real backing vocals and they're probably recorded in real spaces like this and they're probably and the, the reason it sounds so good is because in order to make you know if you want to if you want to make that drum kit out there sound really good you've got to have a number of things you've got an amazing drum kit you've got to have an amazing engineer with amazing mics amazing pre's here you know and somebody who understands the whole way that it works and if you've got all that and and the room probably sorry I've got that out if you got all that, it might still be a shit song, but you're going to get a great drum sound. And there isn't any, there isn't 
it's very hard to it's very hard to shortcut that route. I mean, you can go off and find samples, and you can go and find breaks. If you're finding breaks, they probably they were probably recorded in these kind of this kind of environment. It's quite interesting that although the barriers to entry have come down so far for everybody, if you're really going to make a record that makes a difference, it's quite hard to do it without using these kind of rooms and these kind of techniques, but not impossible, obviously. Everything I've done for the last 20 years, pretty much I've done here. I mean, I'm really lucky because I get, I get, I get use of the Rack microphone. So the so Rack got an amazing microphone collection. Um, we got, got quite a number of 67s and quite a number of 47s, all of which are incredible. What I've found over the last few years, so sort of as a writer, so with like Lewis Capaldi, Tom Walker, I'm trying to think, James Arthur, who are some of the more notable people I've worked with, I think pretty much all of them have ended up using the vocals I did with them in my room on the finished records, which is, which is a testament, not really to my skills, but a testament to how good the rack microphones are because they've done the vocals in that room on fairly basic gear, but with amazing like 15,000 pound microphones and, and haven't really bettered them. I mean, you do get that thing when you write a song, sometimes you do get like a moment of a little spark of something special when you do the vocal for the first time. But I think it's a tribute to the, it's a tribute to the mics we have an incredible mic collection here, a lot of vintage mics, 47s, 67s, 87s. Some of them were colored blue, so that's like the rack's signature kind of, they, they colored it in order to, to, to be able to notice immediately that it's ours, so it's quite, it's quite unique. Rack are always very good at investing in the equipment here, so like Usually at this time of the year, there's like a Christmas wish list. It's like, right, we're going into next year's budget. What do you, like, what are we lacking? What do you need? Like, what do we need? Do we need instruments, microphones, um, outboard? This, I mean, this year, the Christmas list is quite small considering we've just renovated a new studio. The refurbing of Studio 4 was obviously quite a big investment in the future investing in Dolby Atmos. We felt like if we're refurbing a studio that's sort of a writing room and a mixing room, we felt like it, it would be silly not to put it in, but we haven't put all of our eggs in one basket. It is a very hybrid room. The point of the build was that it serves a lot of purposes. You can do anything over there, either like tracking, mics, or like writing sessions, but also um, mixing in stereo or in Atmos. Um, I feel like these days a lot of the studios are going that direction towards like Atmos becomes like a, a standard on, on in the industry and it is really interesting. It really suddenly you have much more possibilities and options and you can your mixes can sound completely different. We are working on a lot of uh, projects uh, with the thought of Atmos mixing on the process of recording. So we're placing the mics in the room already, thinking of how to capture the room. And it's been incredible to hear that, how, how precise you can get with, with that. And then when you go and listen to that, you really feel like you're in the room. Um, because of the mic placement and because of the specific mics that we're choosing and the specific placement in the room that makes it really, like, coherent. I think my favorite moment at Rack was working on, a, on an album that's coming out very soon, which was just an incredible experience that week and, you know, just experimenting a lot and having that like vibe with the band, you know, and just um, feeling like you're a part of something that you really love and believe in and uh, connected to. So that's, I guess, my favorite kind of moment. For the recently released Arctic Monkeys album, they came here to record the strings for that. And on the last day of the session, when all of the strings players had gone home, they essentially were putting the songs together and they were just sort of playing the album through in Studio One with all of the doors open. And so we were all kind of stood in reception 
on a Friday, like, this is great. <laughs> That's all for now. If you like what you saw, please be sure to like and share it and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube. Also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.